Good evening, this is John Milburn. Um, we're dealing with environmental law subjects tonight and the primary topic for this evening is environmental impact assessment. So if you're looking at your text, it's uh, chapter 11 of Bates in the uh, current, the ninth edition. The, um, there are a few things that I want to just mention first, and that is when you're doing your assessment work with me, um, if you haven't worked with me before, do look out for my sample document, which is part of the assessment uh, information that I provide by way of guidance. The sample document is really a Word document. Um, it's a way of setting documents out and it's a way of um, footnote referencing. Footnote referencing is for, always seems to be a, a problem for non-law students. It's not really very difficult. It's just a matter of using the insert footnote um, mechanism, which is in Word. Uh, as part of referencing, just click that. It'll give you the next automatic number, take you down to the footnote where you need to insert material. I like to tab away from the number, insert your case or insert your little piece of legislation or some short commentary. With my assessment work, if you insert words in the footnote, uh, I don't include them in the word count. So you can get away with a few more words if you toss things into the uh, footnote. Uh, a couple of little bugbears, um, when you're referring to legislation, when you're typing it, make sure it's in italics. Same with the names of uh, the participants in a case, italicise their names. Um, watch out for referring to case law um, by reference to a volume or a year. So there's the round brackets or the square brackets. But if you're referring to a case, just repeat what uh, what the citation is. and. Um, Always try to put in pinpoint referencing. So if you're referring to a case, you know, Dietrich and, Dietrich and the Crown, for example, uh, it, 1992, which is in round brackets, 177 CLR 292, that tells me where the case is found. That's the authorised reference for that case. If you're referring to something from page 299 of that case, at the end of the citation, after you've given me the page number where it starts, which is 292, put comma 299 and that will tell me that you're referring to a pinpoint reference of a page within the case. Um, there's different ways of doing it. That's one way of doing it. You can put um, CLR 292 at 299 um, is another way of doing it. So just have a look at the way judges do that when they're writing their decisions and have a look at the way that Bates does it when he's referring to particular parts of a case. So um, learning by looking at what others do and learning through osmosis, I guess, is what I'm really trying to say. So, um, okay. Now, I don't have the assessments up on the screen. Um, I really can't answer any questions in relation to the assessment for 19038, um, but uh, we can perhaps look at trying to work on some assessment questions down the track. Are there any assessment questions for the moment? What's the difference between community and economic need? And do we need to specify in the assignment the difference and not talk about one or the other? Yeah. So from memory in 11046, the question relates to community need. Um, if I'm correct in that, my recollection, bearing in mind I wrote that question a long while ago, um, and I haven't looked at it for a little while. But uh, if it's community need, it seems to me that you should always come back to issues to do with ecological sustainable development. Um, so Section 8 of the um, Sustainable Planning Act deals with ecologically sustainable development. And you recall that ECD has a number of different components, and one of those components is economic. Um, and another is to do with, uh, with ecology and the environment. Um, so it's when you're talking about community, it's a broader topic than it might just seem. It does cater for, amongst other things, economic. Does that go towards answering your question, John? I think so. Okay. Um, All right. okay. So, so, um, so the economic need, like this particular shopping centre, now it's been demonstrated that uh, there is a need for a, a little bit of a shopping centre, but not a big bit of a shopping centre. Um, um, is that different? 
Yeah, a little bit vague there. Different to what? Sorry. Well, it seems that, you know, they both sides demonstrated there was some need for a shopping centre, but one side said, well, okay, there is a bit of a need, but not that big. Yeah. And, of course, the developer said, oh, no, we need a really big, bloody huge one because there's a need. And the judge knocked it back on the fact that it, there wasn't demonstrated need. I mean, is that economic community need? <laughs> Just... <laughs> No, it is well. It, it is a combination of both, and and your question's good in that it highlights um, a couple of things. The first is that to a degree, there's a subjectivity here. Um, it's not an exact science, and ultimately, someone has to make a decision. Um, that usually means weighing up the expert evidence, which Sorry, you. Excuse me. My, yes, excuse me. My fire alarm's going off. Yeah, I can hear I'll that. Just have to excuse me. My. Fire alarm. Oh, okay. Thanks, John. Uh, well, we might come back to John's question when he returns after dealing with that um, fire uh, alarm. Are there any other questions in relation to assessment work? All right. Well, we might come back to John later, but um, for tonight, um, environmental impact assessment. So the concept of EIS is closely linked to project planning. The, the reason I say that using the word planning specifically is that the way in which the legislation is drafted, it is essentially incumbent upon a proponent of an action to undertake some planning, and that planning will normally involve putting in some place some procedures and systems to ensure compliance with the legal requirements um, that relate to that proposal in question. So that is usually part of the EIA uh, process. So as Bates describes, Regulation is the cornerstone of environmental law. And, and that's right, because we're really now talking at the second level of, um, of the trilogy of um, uh, separation of powers. So we've been talking a lot about parliament. Tonight we're talking much more about the executive level, which is where environmental assessment is critical. Um, so what is the purpose of environmental assessment? I'd say it's pretty simple, but what is it? To make sure that the environment is considered in decisions. Yes, that's part of it. Yes, Jase? Um, it's also to make sure that uh, any development or, yeah, I guess that's a good explanation for it, um, is in line with any legislation but also is, I can't think of the word that I'm looking for, but basically is doing the right thing with the environment mm -hmm. and also taking into uh, 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 account the, the ec economic and social and all the other different needs that, that, that need to happen at the same time. Yes, and don't forget, and I, I, I like both those answers. Um, what I like about your answer, Jace, was that you did consider the other aspects of ecologically sustainable development. Um, so it's easily over forgotten when we're dealing with um, environmental law. But really, I think environmental impact assessment is all about providing information, information that will enable the decision makers, regulators particularly, um, but also courts, to make informed and rational decisions. Now, in doing that, they need to take into account the public interest. Um, one thing that I would urge upon you as well is that the environmental assessment is not the decision. And that comes back to a basic principle of law that it's for the regulator at first instance or the court at second instance on a merit appeal to make the decision. And the information which is contained in the environmental assessment is really information. So my first question, I was looking for that word, is information. Um, and that's really what it's, it's about. It's not the decision itself. So information is contained in the environmental impact assessment material for the regulator or the court 
to make a decision, which is in, in very large part based on that information. So the, inf the assessment process is linked to procedures and the procedures that are used depend on the nature of the undertaking which is being sought. And that can vary depending on, on what's being considered. <clears throat> and so not always required. It depends on um, whether the activity is some sort of prescribed uh, activity or pr in a prescribed class of activity before we can say that um, the environmental impact assessment process must be undertaken. And it's also important to understand that it's not a veto. So while the environmental impact assessment must take into account a number of principles, including ecologically sustainable development, decision makers must weigh up a number of factors. And as we've discussed earlier tonight, considering the social and the economic considerations inherent in a proposal are just as much to be considered as the ecological or um, uh, other uh, factors involving the environment. And then I think that really comes back to that John question of uh, John give, gave and or gave uh, presented rather. John's left us again, I see. But um, when we're talking about the community, what I'm really trying to encourage you to do is talk more than just pure environment uh, because it's not just environmental issues that are are uh, to be considered in making an assessment. Okay, you're probably aware of the procedural steps involved in environmental impact assessment. So can you remember what those steps are? Can you walk me through the steps of what's involved in an environmental impact assessment? Any takers? So we're saying that environmental impact assessment is a process it's subject to procedures. And if I was being a really nasty judge, I'd say, all right, well, what are, what are those processes? What are those procedural steps? So John, I just mentioned that uh, we're looking at what are the procedural steps involved in environmental impact assessment. Do we have any takers? I'll start you off. At the so start, yes, John? To, uh notify um, the minister that there may be um, a controlled, um, what's, what's, sorry, the terminology. Uh, controlled action. Yep. Controlled that, that's, action. Yep, that's kind of a little bit, that's part of it, but <clears throat> it's, it's really a subset of what I'll describe as referral. So I think that's the first thing. A proponent comes to you for advice in relation to a project or a development. And you've got to make a decision with the client whether you refer that activity and you'll refer it if it has potential environmental significance to a decision maker. So we've got to think of it in terms of the context of the person making the decision, whether that is the Commonwealth Minister as a result of it being a controlled action or whether it's a local council in relation to some form of general impact accessible development application. But somewhere along the line, we have to think about whether the decision maker needs to have some form of environmental impact statement prepared uh, or other form of documentation as part of the environmental impact assessment. So number one procedural step is referral. And you've got to ask the question, do we need to refer this activity um, or not? Number two, if you do refer the process, what's the if you do refer the activity, what's the next process? Ah, Tiffany's got it, screening, right. So screening. Now, you're not gonna tell us what screening the proposal means or a screening decision, Tiffany? All right, so. Unmute your microphone if you like, Tiffany, but you're right, screening's the second stage. So the screening decision is all about the need to, um, whether, the, whether the proposed activity is likely to have significant effect on the environment. So that's what screening's all about. Yes, John? Would you, you just unmuted, that's all. Okay, I'll continue. Third step. 
Tiffany will be right onto this. What's the third step? Um, determining if it's significant. Yes. So we can say that that is part of what we call scoping. So a scoping procedure, I think Jace knew it, um, to determine the range of matters that need to be addressed in the environmental impact statement. The, the statement is part of the overall assessment. So you'll see EIS and you'll see EIA. Once you've determined the scope, the extent to which the EIS or the EIA process needs to be extended, um, there'll be consultation. And that's with the public, but it's also with other government agencies. So that's step number four. Step number five is a review of the final EIS um, um, assessment authority. And then finally, number six is monitoring. Okay, so let's go back to the first stage. Determining the need for the environmental impact assessment. And um, John identified a very good one, and that is in certain circumstances in the commonal sphere, we need to consider whether it is a controlled action or not. But um, in Queensland, before I get onto the commonal sphere, the um, proposal needs to be considered within the context of different pieces of legislation. One of them, sometimes overlooked, is the State Development and Public Works Organisation Act of 1971. So have a look at the State Development and Public Works Organisation Act, refer to sections 26 and 29, because in some circumstances, the requirement for an environmental impact assessment will be triggered automatically if the proposed activity is within a certain type of uh, activity or class of proposal that's outlined in the legislation. But, but some of it, uh, such as infrastructure, uh, doesn't need it at all and it can't be reviewed. Yes, yes. Are you talking Commonwealth or are you talking State? State, that uh, State uh, Department of Public Works and something yep. Act um, of 1971. Yep. Um, but that's the one that can't be reviewed. So if they decide that we're going to chuck a motorway through here, there's nothing you can do about it. You're right. There are certain provisions where it's not subject to review. And at a Commonwealth level, you're right there in terms of it being potentially a controlled action. And you'll recall we talked about that, I think, in week four. So there is a consultation process that applies after the referral to the federal minister. And the federal minister, the environment minister, determines whether or not the action is a controlled action. So what act do we need to look at to ask the question about, you know, what, what act do we look at that says the minister must consider whether it's a controlled action? Talking federal now. EPBCA. EPBCA, exactly. Yep. So I guess we, the reason for that question is it's almost a knee-jerk reaction. If you've got something which is in the Commonwealth sphere, think EPBCA, and the particular section is Section 74. So at the Commonwealth level, in determining whether or not it's a controlled action, the minister will determine whether or not the proposal has, and here's the phrase you want to remember, significant impact on the environment. And it's up to the minister to determine whether it has the significant impact on the environment, and that is what we call a subjective decision. It's up to the minister to decide. Now, the minister des decides subjectively, meaning whatever he or she says, but there are some rules and they must, the minister must apply the right test to that. And I think we talked about that last week or the week before. So if the action is determined to be a controlled action by the minister, then relevant impacts including past or future or probable impacts must be assessed and there's methods laid out in the Act for doing that. Okay, so what happens if we have a project which has both Commonwealth implications and state implications? Do we, 
do two sets of environmental impact assessment. What happens there? Yes, Suzanne? No. Um, we'll just let Suzanne. Uh, thank the you, Suzanne. Commonwealth um, overrides state. Sorry, Commonwealth overrides the state. In general terms, that's true. But in this particular case, there is a special arrangement in place between the Commonwealth and the states, which came about by agreement. John? Yeah, I know it. <laughs> All right. So what's, what's this agreement that I talk about between the Commonwealth and the states to avoid the duplication of EIA process? You'll kick yourself when I tell you because we've, we've talked about this, I'm sure. No takers? All right, bilateral agreements. So where we have, a bi where we have the bilateral agreement regime, which is put in place to ensure that there is not the duplication of environmental assessment. And it, it all came about following COAG and the agreements that were made um, when the Commonwealth was, um, was were, were knocking the states around in the uh, High Court. So they worked cooperatively towards that. So the point is that pursuant to the bilateral agreement, the Commonwealth authorises the states to undertake the environmental assessment. The final decision is still with the minister when it's a controlled action, but the states do kind of do all the work. And um, so the states will do work in terms of in, uh, environmental impact assessment, both where it's a controlled action or other development proposals that warrant environmental assessment out of their own right. So assuming then that the assessment is being done in the States, let's take Queensland, we need to remember that there are different types of state-based environmental assessment that may apply. We've talked about one tonight already. So that is the assessment under the State Development and Public Works Organisation Act. So that's in part four. So that's one of them. So remember I said, when you're thinking Commonwealth, think EPBCA. When it's state, it's not quite that easy. There are a few pieces of relevant legislation that you might have to have at the forefront of your mind. So when it comes to dealing with state-based environmental assessment, the State Development and Public Works Organisation Act is one of them. There are two others, two other pieces of legislation that may be relevant when it comes to environmental impact assessment. Yeah. Course, yes, John? The SPA and the EPA. Spot on, exactly, that's it. So the Sustainable Planning Act and the Environment, uh, Environmental Protection Act um, are both pieces of legislation which together with the State Development and Public Works Organisation Act may have a bearing on the environmental impact asso assessment. But both of those, uh, so all of those can work in the context of the bilateral agreement regime. Okay, so let's have a look at some websites. I like the websites and um, let's have a look at matters relevant for determining whether the project should be determined a coordinated project or not. So we've been talking about controlled actions, which is at the federal level, but when it's at the state level, it may be um, something which is uh, um, a coordinated project. And uh, that's done through the coordinated, um, coordinated general. So what I'm trying to do is share this screen. So we're getting there, we're getting there. And now you should see the website for um, the coordinator general's office relevant to the State Development and Public Works Organisation Act. And you'll see there, there's some commentary about the way in which the Act assists in coordinating these processes through the Coordinator General's office. And the Coordinator General has the ability to consider in the context of major infrastructure projects, whether the project is a coordinated project or not. And I think that's maybe what you were getting to uh, you were talking about before, John, in the state regime. 
Yes, I was. I just didn't have the uh, the words the State Development and Public Works uh, Organisation Act. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So when it comes to your assignment work, having access to these um, websites is a terrific resource and um, uh, same for any examinations that you might do as well. Okay, so you'll see there that um, the matters that are relevant for consideration are uh, available to be discussed and um, there's some really good fact sheets and templates there as well. Okay, so this Act, the State Development and Public Works Organisation Act, gives the Coordinator General significant power. You'll see there, halfway down, manage infrastructure projects, declare a project to be coordinated, coordinate and regulate program of works, enter and authorise entry onto land, uh, compulsory acquisition of land, think the castle, and implement and manage state development areas. The other thing that's really important to understand is that it does give the Coordinator General the ability to step in when state government departments or local governments or other bodies fail to make a timely decision. So that's the Coordinator General's um, uh, power, as we discussed a moment ago. All right, so what is a coordinated project? You'll see here there's a link to that. Follow that link. These things are really well done. And the coordinated project is one where there are a number of things that may be relevant to the process. I'm not sure that that link, oh yes, here it is. So a coordinated project is one where there's complex approval requirements involving state, local or federal governments significant environmental effects, strategic significance, uh, or strategic uh, significant infrastructure projects. So the Coordinator General gives weight to those various aspects. So have a look at those websites, you know, maybe print a few pages out and just um, work with uh, the terminology because sometimes it can get confusing and a bit overwhelming. But when we're talking about the various aspects for factors to be considered, which was um, what was referred to there, um, that is that the government, the Coordinator General must have regard to detailed information about the project, um, relevant planning schemes, strategic development. The um, Coordinator General is not bound to declare a project, a coordinated project, merely because it satisfies one or more of those um, characteristics. So, but when it is declared to be a coordinated project, that triggers a, a requirement for a whole lot of things, including environmental impact assessment, which is really the nature of what we're talking about tonight. Okay, so when the project is subject to that legislation and going through that procedure, the Act effectively suspends the operation of the Integrated Development Assessment System approval process under the Sustainable Planning Act. So we talked about that as being kind of the bread and butter type process for developing, uh, for uh, working through assessment projects. And uh, But if it goes to that higher level through the um, coordinated project uh, regime, through the Coordinator General, then any of that IDAS process, planning process, will be suspended. I hope that makes some sense. All right, so let's have a look at some current proposals, projects that are being run through the Coordinator General's um, office at the moment. Now, I'll just share the screen again. So I'm just doing a lot of dragging and pasting. Always seems, John, that there's more information in these sessions than there are in the lectures. Um, yeah, they're different. Um, 
this is meant to be a bit more hands-on um, than the lectures, which are a bit more theoretical. So, and, and really, when I set the assessment work, I want it to be relevant to you. Um, I got a really nice email from a former student saying that they're actually working on these things now, and uh, it kind of just helped as an introduction. All right, so here we have the current projects, which are listed as coordinated projects currently going through the environmental impact statement process. And this is through the Coordinator General's Office. So let's have a look at one of them, say the Townsville Port Expansion Project, which is down here. And um, you'll see some basic information about that project, the overview. The investment, $1.65 billion. Jobs, 175 in construction, 180 operational. So that um, website provides you with not only the overview, but it gives you information about the environmental impact statement process and the actual documents. So we talked about the fact that there needs to be the referral. As a result of the referral, there's the scoping, there's the determination of the extent to which the EIS should be undertaken. And ultimately that's reduced to the terms of reference for the EIS. I won't click on that, but you can have a look at that. And it, the terms of the reference is important because it determines the parameters by which the assessment should take place. Now you'll see here that this is in reverse chronological order. So initially when the application was lodged, there was an initial advice statement and then a declaration of this being um, gazetted as a coordinated project. That happened in May 2011. The project was then referred to the Commonwealth Minister who deemed it to be a controlled action. So you can see that this, by looking at the website, it actually gives some meat to these things and gives you an idea of the timing and the order by which things are done. So once it was deemed a controlled action for the Minister for Environment, within the bilateral agreement regime kicks in and the EIA process is uh, undertaken through that, um, through that way. Okay, any questions about that? So it Mr. seems that despite uh, the process and all the rigmarole they go through and the paperwork that they recorded by, as we see, they build it anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I mean, the, the theory is that um, it's supposed to provide some protection um, through that process. But yeah, I mean, not always, not always. Um, you know, like uh, Roger Curry and um, Paradise Dam, uh, that was well advanced in its process. But, uh, you know, the, the, that litigation uh, was involved in um, the, the videos that I've presented through, uh, through that work as well. So not always is the point. But it always seems like, you know, they've improved their process to make it look like they're doing the right thing to build it anyway. <laughs> Yeah. All right. So we talked about the State Development and Public Works Organisation Act. John mentioned that there's a second piece of legislation, the Environmental Protection Act of 1994. So have a look at section 40 of that act because it does outline a number of uh, provisions that relate to the process for environmental impact statement and environmental um, assessment. So if you look at section 40, and I, I don't have a screenshot of it now, but have a look at section 40 because it does talk about the need to consider the pros and the cons. And I know, John, you're going to be cynical about this, um, but the, the process is meant to be objective in the sense that the experts consider the pros and the cons, and not just the environment, but the economic and the social as well, which is really coming back to that issue of why we want to talk about the community aspects of the development in, uh, in one of the assessments. But uh, in, in the section 40 of the Act, it also talks about how the proposal can minimise any environmental impacts, uh, think about feasible alternatives to the proposal and think about involving interested parties, including the public.
So an environmental impact assessment should be, if done properly, quite broad in that it's talking about not only the impact of this possible assessment on the environment, but it's talking about economic, social, it's talking about other alternatives that are available, etc. Um, under the Environment, Environmental Protection Act, there are special rules that relate to environmental assessment for projects such as petroleum and gas. And um, be aware that there are always codes of compliance that need to, to be played uh, to be considered as well. One of the problems with law, I guess, is that it's not just a matter of looking in the one place at the one act. You need to consider legislation above that you need to consider you know from a state level you need to consider the commonwealth legislation above that you need to consider the international treaties below state legislation you need to consider regulations you need to consider um, planning guidelines strategic planning uh, documentation and then codes of practice so there's a whole lot of things that may come into play and then of course you've got case law as well um, Sometimes we have trigger criteria, and uh, I'll just follow a link to show you what I mean by that. Hopefully it will work. And I'll share the screen. So here's an example of guidelines for environmental impact statements through the Department of Environment and Heritage Protection, providing some background as to when a resource activates um, is a trigger for an EIS and give some guidelines as to how the process works from there. Okay, and this is particularly in relation to mining activities. So there's some guidelines that you might want to consider. Um, that is available to you through the Environment of, uh, sorry, the Department of Environment and Heritage Protection, and um, that relates to mining and petroleum projects. So you'll see that under this regulatory strategy, the risk of environmental uh, impacts arising from a pos proposal is a key factor to determining um, how this matter should proceed through that uh, process. Okay, so, um, and but there are standard conditions that may apply. Yes, Suzanne? I just wanted to ask, with all these checks and balances in place, I don't understand why governments can then make their own decisions about infrastructure and not take these things into consideration. Um, for example, we've got um, a road that's going through a koala habitat that's just been approved by the state government west of Brisbane at Dolby. And I don't get that. I don't understand how that can actually happen when the koala population is such a big deal. Yeah, and, and there are very specific um, guidelines in relation to, say, koalas, you know, down in the Redlands area where I used to practice as well. But you're right, um, and unfortunately... I guess, depending on your perspective, unfortunately, but there are these powers which are conferred upon uh, ministers. Um, John identified this as a, an issue before, and um, you're right. Some of the some of the issues that we're talking about are only able to be attacked on judicial review in very limited circumstances where the minister must comply with legal guidelines, but not necessarily in the context of what we call a merits review which is the case for maybe the bread and butter type developments where um, the merits of the decision can be attacked and considered in the planning and environment court. But it's a good observation, Suzanne, um, but it's more a political issue than uh, a legal issue in that sense. All right, so... It's all yes, about job, jobs and growth. Uh, it's all about jobs and growth, but... Uh, which becomes irrelevant when you can't drink the water or breathe the air and all the animals have died. No, I hear what you jobs saying. and growth is irrelevant. Yeah, yeah. All right, so um, the, do have a look at um, 
some of those websites that relate to the environmental impact assessment process through the Environmental Protection Act. I do want to move on to the EIS process under the Sustainable Planning Act, which is the third piece of state legislation. But before we do, I'm just hopefully going to show you um, an environmental impact statement that was prepared for a particular uh, project, the Baralaba North project. And um, this involved complying with requirements under the EPBCA. So again, I'll just share the screen. The idea of showing you these things is maybe to put a bit of life into the, to the process so that you actually see that these things are real and not just referred to in a textbook. So this is what the actual EIS is for that um, uh, Baralaba North uh, project. And um, these are huge documents. Can anyone give me an idea of how much it might cost if you're a proponent, how much it might cost to prepare a decent EIS? Or go through uh, the... 500, 500K to 4 million. Yeah. Did you, did, uh, did you hear that off the website, uh, the uh, link with Phil Jeston? Yes, I did. Yeah, that's it. Yep. Um, so... I mean, we're not talking small amounts of money. We're talking big money to put these things together. So if your plan in doing this course is to work in this industry, then um, while you're able to do much good, of course, you can also earn a lot of money because there's huge amounts of money involved in this. Anyway, so the idea there is just to show you what an EIS looks like in terms of um, uh, the, the layout and um, that, it's a huge document, of course, so I won't go through it all. But um, sometimes if you look at these things, they're actually a really good teaching tool because all well, there, for example, is a, um, uh, you know, a flowchart. And some of these flowcharts can actually really help to explain uh, the situation easily. Okay, so the third piece of state legislation relevant to environmental impact assessment is the Sustainable Planning Act. So we know that, and um, it, it depends on the nature of the application under consideration whether we need that. If you're thinking Sustainable Planning Act, the process that should immediately come to your mind is the what system. IDAS. Very good. What's it stand for? I don't uh, have um, <laughs> stuff. <laughs> close, but not close enough. Can you remember what IDAS stands for? So it's the IDAS under the SPA. All right, it's the. I'm looking for. I, I know it only applies to. It only applies to accessible development. What type of accessible development? Um, you, not the code I'll narrow, accessible. I'll, I'll, no, I'll narrow it down to two. It's, is, it, is it code or is it impact? Have a punt. It's 50-50. Impact, not yes. code. Impact. Impact, not code. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it only applies to impact accessible development. So it's the um, integrated development assessment system is IDAS, which is under the Sustainable Planning Act. Okay, so it only applies to avail um, accessible development requirements. Uh, think impact accessible, and um, uh, it can be code or impact. Uh, actually, sorry, I'm looking at some notes, and it can apply to potentially to both. The impact, the the requirement for impact accessible development, uh, and IDAS is really in relation to merits appeal. So I'm going to correct myself and go with what you said, John. Um, that theoretically it could apply to code accessible, but I really don't think it would in practice. I think we're really talking impact accessible. Can, can I get paid as much as you? <laughs> Absolutely. Once you finish your degree, you'll be earning bucket loads more than I do. Don't you worry about that. All right. Um, so are there any questions then about the state process, which is really what I wanted to talk about primarily tonight. I have glossed over SPA terribly, haven't I?
Do you want me to talk more about the impact development assessment system? Sorry, the integrated development assessment system. Okay. All right. So have a look at the Sustainable Planning Act is the first thing. And in the context of the, environment, the Sustainable Planning Act, have a look at IDAS, which is really the strategic planning part of that um, legislation. And it is only accessible development that requires a development permit. So the key, the first point is that environmental impact assessment will only apply to accessible de development. And I'm going to, I stand corrected on what I said before, it could be code or it could be impact. So of all the different types of assessment that could be possible, uh, it's only the accessible development that we're talking about. And the specifics will be determined by, typically by regulation. And um, what you need to do is have a look at sections 260 and 272 of the Sustainable Planning Act to get an idea of um, what type of um, proposal uh, is given and, and the proposal needs to be given to the assessment manager. When we talk about an assessment manager under the IDAS regime, who are we talking about? Probably the council. Yeah, I agree with that. I would say probably the council. When we, when we talk about a concurrence agency, who are we talking about? You got me. <laughs> okay. All right. So the reason I'm asking that is that the requirement for the environmental impact statement applies to accessible development under the Sustainable Planning Act, and it applies to certain types of development that are prescribed by regulation. But the proponent gives the proposal to the assessment manager, which is the council, and to relevant referral agencies. Now, these relevant referent referral agencies are really what we call concurrence agencies. They're not the assessment manager, but they have a real interest in the proposal and essentially have a right of veto. Um, so a concurrence agency is an agency that can come in and um, ask for more information about the process or impose conditions. This is all done through the assessment manager, but they have a, a real part to play in the process. Um, once the proposal... Well, who, would, who would that be? Who would that be? Who's, who's, a, who's that? Well, we'll look out for... Have, each case can be different, but it might be something to do with um, uh, water or it might be to do with other process, electricity. Uh, it could be uh, any form of um, different bodies could be the concurrence agencies. But you'll see that very often in the planning and environment court decisions, you'll see reference to um, concurrence agencies. Um, are you talking about um, state agencies like the, the water board and yes. people like that? Yes. Yep. Okay. So um, I'm, just, I'm just Googling actually to see, like here, to take an example, um, Redland City Council. And I'm just looking to see if um, what type of concurrence agencies the council there may refer a um, a development application to. So I've got the concurrence agency referral form. I just thought it might have a list, John, of um, different concurrent agencies. So it's like a tick box. Uh, I haven't been through this exercise before, but I'll just see if they're there. No, look, I need to, I need to look at that, um, and it's a good idea to to get a, a real feel for precisely who these concurrent agencies could be in different circumstances. So I'm sorry I can't take that any further at the moment. I see your bandwidth hasn't really improved much, John. Oh, it's just dreadful, and and I don't know what it is about a Thursday night. I think Thursday night it just seems to be awful. But, and, uh, and have you got colour TV and roads yet? 
<laughs> you ask me the same thing every week. Yeah, we've we've got the roads. We're working on the colour TV. That's on its way, apparently. All right. Um, so in terms of the concurrence agencies, let's have a look at that and pay some particular attention to who that might be in different cases. So once the development uh, proposal is put forward, then um, the chief executive determines the terms of reference. So remember we saw that terms of reference in the context of um, the um, controlled action, uh, Townsville. So there will be a terms of reference and the final decision. And that goes back to those six steps that we talked about earlier on in terms of the overall process. Okay, so that's probably all I wanted to cover tonight. So who determines the terms of reference? Yeah, that's done in consultation. But have a look at one of those terms of reference and you'll get a, a real feel for how it comes into existence. But it's done essentially by the minister um, and, uh, and it's a consultation process. And the public are involved and other concurrence agencies are involved as well. Okay. All right. Well, we might... Any questions, comments? All good? All right. Thank you very much for your patience tonight. Nice to see some more people here. Last week, it was just John and I. So uh, thank you. We had a crowd of people today. That's great. All right. I'll stop the recording.